Every week on CyberWork, listeners ask us the same question. What cybersecurity skills should I learn? Well, try this. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to get your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. We took notes from employees and a team of subject matter experts to build training plans that align with the most in-demand skills. You can use the plans as is or customize them to create a unique training plan that aligns with your own unique career goals. One more time, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free or click the link in the description to get your free training plans, plus many more free resources for cyber work listeners. Do it. Infosecinstitute.com slash free. Now, on with the show. Today on Cyberwork, our old pal John Wagnon, InfoSec skills author and keeper of the secrets of OWASP, joins me today to talk about the big changes to the OWASP top 10 that happened at the end of 2021, as well as his own class teaching the top 10, some job tips, study hits, and career pivots for those interested in these vulnerabilities. Also, find out why access managers are going to rule the world someday. That's all today on Cyberwork. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. John Wagnon has been a guest on Cyberwork before. Uh, he was talking about InfoSec skills and some of the best practices for skills-based learning. Uh, and he recently recorded, and when I say recently, I mean about two minutes ago, he recorded a video for our Career Profile Cities uh, series on the role of secure coder. Uh, for those of you who work in vulnerability, AppSec, DevSecOps, and other related fields, uh, you're probably already aware of the fact that the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP, uh, has done something that they don't do all the time or every year. They revised and significantly updated their top 10 list of the most common security vulnerabilities to reflect the current state of affairs. Uh, John teaches an OWASP top 10 class as part of InfoSec Skills and as a boot camp, I believe, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a skills learning path. That's exactly right. Okay, yeah. and and he so he keeps clo very close tabs on all these uh, updates. So uh, whether you're knee deep in the Vuln research or just curious about this top ten list, uh, this is the episode to listen to. John, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to Cyberwork. Chris, it's always a pleasure, man. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, great. So um, it's been a while since your last episode, so I'll I'll ask again to help our listeners get a sense of your personal history. How did you first get involved in cybersecurity, and how how did you come to create and teach courses for Infosec? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I mean, really, right out of college or in college, I, my undergrad was computer engineering, so I kind of you know started off in that field, yep. and then I was in the Air Force for about nine years. I did computers, you know, communication stuff there. Um, and and then beyond the Air Force, I've I've done uh, you know cyber threat analysis, you know consulting for the Air Force and DoD, and and uh, and the and then I've worked for a couple of different companies um, after that, and just you know so I've been in this for you know goodness twenty something years now, right? So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's been kind of cool to see see the world change, you know, since oh, uh, yeah. since way back when I started. But that's I mean it really did start kind of in college for me and. You know, and that's not the that's not the story for everybody. There's a lot of people that jump in, you know, after the fact, or it's like, hey, I used to do, I was a plumber or something, and now I do like <laughs> computer security stuff. So I mean, there's all kinds sure. of ways to get into this thing. And and then as far as teaching, I've mm -hmm. always loved to teach. I've just enjoyed that, and uh, and so uh, I got connected to InfoSec a few years ago, and and uh, you know, you guys were like, hey, let's we got these learning paths and all that stuff. And I was like, Hey man, that'd be awesome. And there's a need for yeah. the OWASP. And, and so uh, you guys had the need for the OWASP course and, yep. and I enjoy that stuff. And I was like, Hey, cool. let's, let's get together, man. Let's do this thing. So it's was, it was a lot of fun. Fantastic. So um, uh, on an early episode of Cyberwork, uh, if you all want to go back, it's November 18, 2018 episode. I interviewed Jeff w Jeff Williams, who was a, a major early contributor to the OWASP Top 10. Uh, so if you haven't heard it, I'd recommend uh, seeking it out for a deep dive into OWASP history and the, and the, the roots of it. But for expediency's sake, uh, John, can you summarize the use of the OWASP Top 10 list, what it tracks, and why a massive shifting and updating like the one we saw in 2022 is so important? Yeah, no, absolutely. OWASP, OWASP is an organization. It's an open community. 
And really, they're dedicated to keeping the world secure. They're dedicated to keeping applications secure, you know, in the in the world today. Mm-hmm. And so it consists of volunteers all over the world. I mean, it, if someone's watching today and they're like, hey, I want to get involved, you totally can. So yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a uh, it's an open source community or just an open community um, that uh, that and, and then like you said they do this um, they do a lot of different things but one of the yeah. things that they do one of the popular things that they're known for is this top ten list and it's like hey what's the OAuth top ten well yep. it is the it is the top ten security risks web application security risks in the world today and the way that they the way that they figure that out is they go out and put out basically like a call for papers. I mean, it's like a, mm. hey, organizations that would be willing to give us data, um, you know, they're gonna, they post it on their Facebook page and their Instagram and their Twitter and their whatever, you know, or send out emails. I mean, however they can yeah. get people to, to come back and give them information. And OWASP has earned an, a name and kind of a reputation, obviously, along the along the way that, that now companies know to kind of be looking for the call for information. But they right. put out this call and they say, hey, organizations, tell us, like what, what are the big problems you're seeing in the world today, right? And so then right. they just get all of this data that they compile together. And again, one of the fascinating things to me is it's is the OWASP organization itself. It's a group of volunteers and it's it's just, you know, people that want to make the world a safer place. And so they give up their time and they go through all this data and they say, okay, how do we how do we take this data and turn it into what ends up being a top 10 list? And there's this whole methodology that they go through mm-hmm. and they had to figure out what that methodology is. And so they right. put in a ton of time. So I really appreciate those guys. Um, but anyway, but ultimately what comes out of that is this top 10 list. And they say, OK, in the world of web applications today, these are the top 10 biggest risks that are out there. And so then organizations can you know, look at that and say, okay, hey, I need to, I need to keep an eye on that stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then to your point, you know, the list changes over time and they don't, they yeah. don't, they don't uh, publish this every single year. It's about, and they don't even have like a, a set, an exact schedule. Yes. Right. Um, so they just published one at the end of 2021, mm-hmm. um, which as of this recording is just a few months ago, right? right. And then, um, and then the, the one before that was in 2017. So it was like four exactly. years. Yeah. Um, right. There, there have been some iterations where they they waited like three years. So it's been three years in between. Some it's been four years. So it's it's kind of in the three to four year range. Okay. Um, you know, then that's when that's when maybe a new one comes out. Um, but that list, as you can imagine, as the world changes, as you know, applications change, all that stuff, then that list is going to change, right? So that's why people are always interested in like, hey, what's the current, you know, what's the current security posture of the world today? Um, so it's um, so that anyway, that's what the top 10 list is. So it's a really it's a really good document. So what, what are what were some of the more surprising changes about the OS top 10 from t- or late 20, 2021, whether it's it's vulnerabilities that climbed in the rankings, the ones that left the list, the ones that were just introduced. Is there also is there a, a lot of weight to the numerical ranking of the vulnerabilities? Because I know things go up and down. Um, mm-hmm. And what does the reordered list say about the ways that vulner- vul- vulnerability issues have changed and evolved or devolved over the last couple of years? Yeah, no, great questions. So the 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 methodology or the approach for this list was a little mm-hmm. bit different than the 2017 or even even years before that. Um, and that goes back to what I said. You know, this this group has to get together and figure out like, hey, how do we even approach this data? Right, this yeah. data that has come in from all these organizations. Which, by the way, there's organizations all over the world that just dump. They're willing to just dump their data into OWASP and say, hey, if this can be helpful, then please use yeah. it. Yeah. Um, which is awesome. So we appreciate those companies too that are willing to share. For sure. Um, and so anyway, what kind of in a general sense, what OWASP has done in previous iterations of the top 10 is they would go out to organizations and say, hey, we want your data, but kind of keep it in the bounds of, you know, this certain these certain areas, you know, like that's the most interesting thing to us yeah. as OWASP, right? So right. they sort of guided everybody. Um, well, this this most current one, the 2021 list, they sort of just they took off the the you know the guardrails. They okay. said, hey, just give us anything you got, just dump yeah. it on us, right? Um, which frankly turned into the largest data set that they've ever had in the history of the OWASP top 10, which is awesome. Uh-huh. So they had a lot to deal with, or a lot to use. Um, and so, but also based on that, based on the kind of opening the aperture there, if you will, mm-hmm. and then the methodology that they used. They really were trying to go after what I'll call the the root cause of an issue rather than like a symptom. So, like okay. for example, 
the 2017 list had uh, one of the uh, one of the risks that was on the 2017 list was XML external entities. XXE is how they is how they abbreviate that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but then on the um, that was on the 2017 list. That was one of the top ten. Yep. But on the 2021 list, that XXE has been has been like integrated into or you know made part of the number five risk, which is security misconfiguration. And okay. so that's so just to give you an idea, they're like, hey. Really, the root problem of like an XXE vulnerability is that your security is misconfigured. You know, there's, okay. there's misconfiguration problems in your web application. And so then that these, these XXE kind of things pop out as a result of that. So we're going to kind of pull it down to the root. So I say that to say when you look at the 2021 list, it's a bit it's a bit more broad in, in nature in terms of each mm-hmm. item that's listed on there. That's not true 100 percent of them, um, but they they've really gone after the root cause rather than the symptom. Um, and so you you mentioned like, hey, are there some that have like, you know, changed Has the list changed mm-hmm. um, a couple that I would point out is uh, there, there's a new one, uh, cryptographic failures. In fact, that's number two on the 2021 list. And again, yeah. that's one of those root cause um, so like, and in fact, just to give an example on that one too, the number two on 2021 is cryptographic failures. Uh, there was another one on the 2017 list called sensitive data exposure mm. and sensitive data exposure has been pulled into like, Hey, the reason that our sensitive data is being exposed everywhere is because the underlying cryptography has uh, problems, right? Yeah, and so yeah. the sensitive data exposure from the 2017 list has been, has been kind of combined into, or, or, you know, loaded I into, see. if you will, the cryptographic failures item on 2021. Um, mm-hmm. And so, but there's a few that are still on the list. I'll point out injection. If you've been around a wasp top mm-hmm. 10 at any, oh, you know, yeah. for any length of time, you know, our good friend, the injection attack, right? Oh yeah. Um, and so that's been on the list forever. It has actually, it's been number one for a while, frankly, but it's now number three on the hmm. 2021 list, which is interesting. Um, yeah. And so, uh, so anyway, uh, the number one item is broken access control. And so there's, hmm. you know, I, this is my kind of a, my thought around that broken access control. You know, in today's world, you've got applications that are available, you know, to all kinds of different people all over the place. You've got people working from home. You got people working in the coffee shop. You mm-hmm. got people working at thirty-five thousand feet in an airplane while they're flying, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. so it's like, how, you know, the underlying problem there is how do I keep, you know, access control around my application? Yeah. Um, and so who gets to get in and who doesn't get in? And, you know, back in the day, it was like, hey, we all sat in our little office at work. And, you know, there was a there was this, you know, internal, like trusted network and anyone mm-hmm. coming out of that network. We trust them. Right. Because they're sitting in the office. Well, yeah. now that doesn't exist anymore. Everybody's everywhere. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's it's created a lot of a lot of issues from a security standpoint. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of that's bumped broken access control all the way to the top. So that's the. That's the number one on the twenty the twenty so three list. So yeah. is, it is it is a weighted ranking though. So what number one? Yes, means, I'm sorry. Big one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's a great point. And I'll, just mm-hmm. a quick word on that. Yeah, number mm-hmm. one as it as, in, t- in terms of the data that was shared and all that stuff. Number one is more critical. Like it is a bigger deal than number ten, right? And right. so they are weight they are weight ranked. It's not like hey, here's just 10, 10 of them in no particular order. They yeah. are in a criticality ranked order. Got it. Um, and uh, and frankly, not to, not to shamelessly plug my course, but if you watch the course, then you'll Please. learn you'll learn a lot more about the methodology yeah. that they use and the the mentality and the and the approach on how they figure out hey which one's number one and which one's number two right so we go into yeah. all that um, but anyway but then also I was going to point out quickly is the the OWASP organization because of all the input from all these or, all these other companies around the world they have a, of course the top ten list that, that they've put together. But I always like to say this, the OWASP top 10 list is not necessarily your organization's top 10 list, right? Yes. So you may you may have, you know, like, for example, cryptographic failure, that's number two on the list. That may be your number one, you know, or mm-hmm. injection may still be your number one, right? Yeah. Um, and so don't necessarily take the OWASP top 10 and say, okay, well, then that is that that directly maps to our okay. organization. Yeah. It's, it's more of an, a, it's, it's an awareness document. That gives you an idea of the state of application yeah. security today. It's the state of the world. Okay, yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. That's mm-hmm. right. But uh, but but you're right though to you know to point out again, it is a weighted list. You know, so number one is more critical. It's more severe. 
than number 10 or number 10, you know, whatever. So it, it yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, and so that also doesn't necessarily, it's not prescriptive in terms of uh, the order that you address the issues within your own company. You know, it's not like Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's like you need a home before you can start looking yeah. for love or whatever. It's like, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to, you know, repair broken access control necessarily before you get into, you know, number eight or whatever. That's right. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Chris, some people, some people find love before they have a home. You know, that's kind true. Of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Who knows? It's not a requirement. No, yeah. but you're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's, uh, yeah. you know, again, for, for your organization, you need to look at your own application. You need to look at your own, you know, security posture and, and all that stuff, all the threats and vulnerabilities and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And then you need to kind of rank order for yourself. You may have you may have a really critical security risk that's not even on the top 10 list, you know, right. but it may be mm -hmm. a really big deal for you. Right. So, yeah. yeah so just kind of proceed with, with that in mind. Uh, so I asked Jeff Williams of this on the on the previous episode, and I'll ask you as yeah. well. And it might be a naive question, but why why do you think these same types of vulnerabilities never go away? I mean, obviously, just knowing about them isn't enough. So, what are some safeguards that would cut down on the instances of these types of vulnerability in everyday work life? And, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah, that that's a great question. I would say um, you know there, there's a lot of old applications still out there. So I mean, you know, again, we're in the world of app of web applications, right? Application security. And there's still a ton of old applications out there that, you oh, know, yeah. hey, business, whatever, created this thing back in, you know, 2000, um, mm -hmm. which for, for me, by the way, it sounds weird to say 2000 has been 22 years ago, but, uh -huh. anyway, but it is. Um, so, you know, let's say you created one way back then and all these new modern things or operating systems were not around then. And but, you know, you just haven't gotten around for a thousand different reasons. You haven't gotten around to updating that application. But it's it's such a critical application for your business. You know, maybe it's yes. your billing application or it's your, you know, whatever inventory control and whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and you cannot get rid of that thing. Um, yeah. And so that's still out there. And, you know, and, and so that introduces a lot of problems, those types of things. Right. Um, we uh, we we had a, a conversation earlier in a, in a separate video about secure coding, you know, mm -hmm. just that whole career path. Um, yep. And so anyway, so when people are writing applications, when they're creating these applications, if they're not using secure practices, and they're just trying to, you know, hey, the boss is on my back. I got to get this thing written, you know, by this afternoon. And so it's just, OK, here it is, you know, just have it, whatever. And but that happens all the time. And yeah. so uh, so then, you know, vulnerabilities happen that way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that's that's a reason that these things are just constantly popping up. Mm -hmm. um, you've got users end users that don't behave properly. And that is, you know, <laughs> right. it's like, hey, I'm I'm not supposed to open that thing or click on that link or whatever, but I mm -hmm. do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, so you mentioned safeguards. I think a few a few things really are. They go back to the basics of what I just said. I mean, as an end user, um, don't click on the suspicious links. Don't open the weird, you know, attachment in the email. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, that is a that is still like phishing attacks. They'll get you every time. It's, I mean, it is a massive thing. That is still like one of the number one, if not the number one attack vectors that uh, that attackers will use is just phishing because it still works, right? Absolutely. Um, so anyway, you know, don't, you know, use a strong password. Don't leave your computer unattended and just walk off in the middle of the mm -hmm. airport or whatever, right? So it's, right. it's those kinds of things. Use another way you could use multi-factor authentication. That's where, you know, username and password, but then you have to like pull out your phone and punch in the little, you know, yeah, code or whatever. Totally. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good thing to employ. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the safeguards I think that we could put in place, you know, just given mm -hmm. the world that we're in. If you're mm -hmm. on the development side, if you're like, hey, I'm creating this stuff, then you need to use secure coding practices. You know, there's yep. uh, there's different standards that you can use that can help guide you. And, uh, but you know, write, you need to write secure code. And yeah. uh, and that would, you know, that'll do your, that'll be your little part to make the world a safer place, right? So those are a Perfect. few things. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that dovetails perfectly into my next question for listeners yeah. not currently working in the area of cybersecurity or not in the industry at all and are just watching this out of curiosity, uh, but who find this discussion of the OWASP top 10 list and all the different types of vulnerabilities there are to be patched and secured. Um, what can you do with this info? What types of career paths or job roles involve this type of work? Because it's not just, uh, you know, secure coding or patch management, but like, <laughs> I assume that there's DevSecOps elements, there's there's access management and all these different things. But can you sort of walk me through some of these different uh, group paths? Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. Um, and this is not going to be an exhaustive list, you know, the, sure. because this this computer, this cybersecurity world that we live in is just a massive place. 
Mm -hmm. And there's so many different job opportunities out there, which is a good thing, you know, but also for someone that's just starting out, you may look at this, you know, massive world and say, man, this is a daunting place. Like, how do I even get in or where do I start, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, so some of the things you mentioned, patch management or secure coding or, you know, some of these DevSecOps roles, you know, that those kinds of things are absolutely, uh, absolutely, you know, possibilities out there or open opportunities out there. Um, I did a quick search of like a a really popular career website the other day. And I Mm -hmm. just typed in like, you know, um, software developer or uh, I don't remember all the different the some of the keywords I used. But I mean, there were a there was a laundry list of these things. I mean, jobs yeah. open everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was everything. I think it, on the software developer side, I mean, I found there was, there was like a farming equipment company that's like, yeah. we need to write some applications. There's yep. banks, there's insurance companies, there's, yep. you know, there's retail stores, there's all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. that's open out there. Um, so certainly you could be in software development, um, but you could do you could do a number of things. Like you said, patch, you know, patch management. How do you you know, how do you patch these systems and when do you do that? And, you know, mm-hmm. especially if you have these really big, complex applications, you yeah. know, do you have to kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, you, you're going to have to restart the computer, right? To like yeah. make them, to make them uh, take the patch, right? Well, how do you, yep. how do you restart the actual web server that's like serving up your data like all the time mm-hmm. and it's your business critical? So there's, you know, sometimes there's like maintenance windows where it's like, all right, we got to wait till like next Thursday or a week from next Friday or whatever it is, right? Um, before we can turn off this this system and patch it up. But in the meantime, there's a massive vulnerability that's just mm-hmm. sitting out there completely open for anyone to take advantage of. Yeah. Um, and so there's some of that risk management. There's, you know, so there, there's a lot of different, a lot of different places you could, um, you could start, um, I think I think InfoSec does a great job of giving different, you know, career paths or skill yep. paths, you know, to say, hey, if you're interested, just take this path, you know, and and uh, and that that gets you into this world. And at least it can start to give you some ideas of, of where you might want to start. So, yeah, I you know, it, it, you're my, I think, 189th guest or something on the show. And <laughs> and I learn a lot as much uh, from folks as, as any of our listeners do. And I'm you know, I was constantly amazed that, you know, there's entire jobs, careers, things with, uh, you know, promotion potential for things like access management, making sure who has access to what types of documents or what parts of the system, you know, and it's, and there's just so much of living online now that there's so many different places where you can sort of pitch in and be really good at one specific thing that you like doing. And you, like you said, you can go anywhere you want with it. Uh, I, I totally agree. I mean, that, that's yeah. a great example of the access management stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, in fact, like we said on the OWASP top 10, broken access control is the number one number security one. out there. So, yeah. I mean, if, if you're an access manager expert or access mm-hmm. management expert, then my goodness, you can write your own ticket almost. You know, it's like, yeah. hey, because everybody needs that stuff. And it, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, some people may look at that and say, well, I don't want to like, you know, pigeonhole myself into like, hey, I have to be this access management expert. Right. Um, I wouldn't look at it like that. I would say, hey, do that. Do a really good job at it and then get to know that world, you know, and then you yeah. be like the expert. But then you can you can always like laterally move or maybe move up or whatever it is and, mm-hmm. you know, do a little something else in an organization. So yeah, see what else is interesting to you while you're there. Totally. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So don't be afraid that, Hey, I'm going to pigeonhole myself and I'm just going to do nothing but access management or access control for the rest of my life. You know, that's that's not, that's not how it works. So yeah, you're you're not chained to your desk. Yeah. That's right. right. (laughs) Um, So uh, let's, let's talk again about you. So tell us what, uh, what students who enroll in your OWASP top 10 class will be learning about what they'll be actively working with, what the assignments will be like and, and what they'll be able to, translate to their jobs or the jobs they want at the end of it? Yeah, of course. Of course. Well, so if you take the class, you'll obviously learn about OWASP, right? So mm-hmm. in fact, the the very first, like, uh, I don't, I hesitate to use the word lecture, you know, because it's, yeah. I think, I feel like, I feel like we're just having fun in there, you know, we're yeah. just, mm-hmm. we're just exploring the space together, right? So, um, so the first video kind of set is all about the OWASP organization, like who are they, where mm-hmm. do they come from, what motivates them, all that kind of stuff, how do they do what yep. they do, right? Um, and then, of course, we dive into the top 10. So there's one video per, uh, you know, per security risk on the top 10. And so in those, you learn how you learn about the risk, you know, so when you use broken access control, for example, what does that even mean in the world of, of modern applications today? And, you know, right. how do 
how do APIs, you know, play a part in that and, you know, different application access problems, whatever, right? So we talk about that. So sort of the fundamental of each of the risks. And then, you know, I give you different examples, um, talk about how to protect yourself against, you know, some of these problems that that arise out of these security risks. Mm -hmm. So you'll learn, you know, all of those things. Um, and then, you know, talking about how do you how do you translate? How you, how would you be able to translate that to your job? Mm -hmm. um, well, if you're, a, you know, I'll go back to like a software developer. If you're a software developer, then you'll understand, you know, hey, as I develop code, then these are like the these are 10 things I really need to kind of keep an eye out for. Right. I need to keep yeah. an eye out um, and don't make these mistakes if you possibly can avoid them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, but if you're not a developer, if you're just like an end user, whatever, it gives you a better idea of like a, of, a, of the state of the application security world today. You know, mm -hmm. um, maybe you didn't even realize that, you know, one of them is uh, cryptographic failures. Like I said before, you yeah. know, maybe you didn't even realize like how big of a deal that is or that it right. that was even a thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, so, yeah, so that's so I, th I think it's just a good it's a good awareness uh, path. To, mm -hmm. You know, if you if it's if it doesn't directly translate to your job, it just it kind of increases your knowledge in that yeah. you know, in that area. So it'd be good to take either way. I, I would encourage every person on the planet to take it. Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? And, yeah, why and, not? And, and to that point, um, you know, we were saying before, like if you're in secure coding or you're in access management, you know, to be looking around while you're while you're there, something like the OWASP, I think, is is, is just it's kind of like this this tower that gives you a vantage point to so mm -hmm. many other, you know. So as you're learning that, you're also thinking like, okay, now you could go in this direction, you go in this direction, and and it's so it's it really is kind of like you know the perfect like fork in the road or whatever that branches yeah. off in all different directions. So that's great. That's right. Um, so if you don't have experience in this area, but you've done your reading, you've learned about OWASP and MITRE and have a strong theoretical knowledge about patching and securing these issues, how do you ex acquire hands-on experience to show mm -hmm. potential employers that you can do the work? Yeah, that's a great question. Great. That's, mm -hmm. that's the that's the old, you know, the age old problem. It's like, yeah, man, yeah. I, yeah. I need 10 years of experience, but how do I get that? You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I've seen some, I've seen some job postings. It's like, hey, you need, you know, five years of experience with this certain technology. And mm -hmm. it was, and and the funny thing is, is it's like that technology was developed like three years ago. So uh -huh. some, yeah. some people need to update their resume or not the resume, yeah. but the job posting stuff. Anyway, right. um, or, or get a time machine. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. You yeah. need to invent the flux capacitor. That's number one. And then all right. Anyway, you can um, probably write your own ticket for that. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Um, so, but no, I would say if you're, you know, again, if you're a developer, if you're a web application developer, software developer, you can you can look at things like uh, open source projects. Mozilla's mm. got some really good ones. Yep. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. VS Code. There's um, there's some different, a lot of different Python ones. And anyway, there's a you just type in open source project on on uh, Google, and you'll totally find a ton of them. Or type it in on on Mozilla on Firefox or whatever, right? Sure. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, but but you can use those. And basically, what these organizations have done, I use Mozilla, is they've said, hey, we're developing all kinds of different code and different projects we're working on. And mm -hmm. these are different little tasks or different features that we want to build into our product, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then they just open that up to the community, to the whole world. And they say, if anybody has experience or can solve this little problem, then do it. And so you would take one of take one of those, uh, you know, open source projects, one of those little tasks, and you would say, hey, I know how to write, you know, in Python or, or Java or C Sharp mm -hmm. or, or Go or whatever, right? And then you would you would take that and you would, you know, write an application or you would you would solve that problem basically, right? Um, and then you can take that and you, you you hand it back to the company and say, hey, I've solved this problem for you. And maybe they accept it. Maybe they say, hey, we need to tweak it a little bit or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, there you are. There you've contributed to the project. And then that, you know, that is that is absolutely gaining experience yeah. in this uh, in this area. Right. If you're um, you know, you could do other things if you're not a software developer, there's a um, there's a thing called the common vulnerability scoring system. Mm -hmm. um, and that that scores like if there's different vulnerabilities that pop up in different applications or different code or whatever software, then they'll, uh, they'll assign it the CVSS score like 10 is really bad and one is not so bad, you know, kind of a thing. Okay. 
Um, but there's uh, but there's a CDSS uh, special interest group. It's the CDSS SIG, right? Because everything's going to be an acronym. Um, and this is uh, and you can you can contribute to that. So you can just you know type in CDSS SIG on the internet or on Google or whatever, um, and you'll find it. And so you can you can request to be a part of that group, and you can either contribute to the group. Or even if you're like, hey, I don't really have anything to contribute. I just kind of want to sit on the back row and watch. You can do yes. that too. And you can just follow along. Cool. But that gives you a good, it gives you some good experience on like, hey, what's the state of vulnerabilities and you know, which which software applications or frameworks are problematic today, right? Yeah. Um, those kinds of things. So that's uh, so that's you know, that's another area that you could, you know, that you could look at to try to gain some experience without even and and that's completely independent of whatever job you have today, right? So mm-hmm. you can do that regardless of, of where you work. So a couple of things. Okay. So um, I'm guessing that this type of uh, vulnerability finding and remediation isn't usually a top of the ladder job. This isn't something CISOs do for say. Uh, but so if you f- do find yourself doing this type of work, what are the common career trajectories from here? What what are the next common next steps for vulnerability managers and secure coders and the like? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, just, you know, I guess to be fair, some people, some people enter this world and let's, we'll pick on like a software developer Mm -hmm. and they absolutely love it. And they're like, I just want to do this forever. You know, it's like, okay, okay, just keep doing that forever, man. Be awesome Mm -hmm. at your job. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, but some people are like, Hey, I'll do that for a little bit. Now I've kind of got the itch, you know, to go, you know, or whatever, to, to go do something else. So, you know, you can always, uh, let's say you're on a, on a team of maybe software developers or on a, you know, vulnerability patching or, you know, whatever kind of team, yeah. then, you know, I would say, regardless of where you are, do a great job, you know, show up mm-hmm. to work every day, ready to work and, you know, give it your best, do hundred percent, right. Kind of thing. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, as they say, the cream will rise to the top, you know, and, uh, and you're, you'll get noticed, you know, by your employers mm-hmm. that th- this whole, this whole cybersecurity world is just woefully understaffed. And so there's not that many people that are doing it. And so if you are doing it and then you do a good job, it's like, man, you're a, you're a, you know, yeah. you've, you've just hit the gold mine kind of a thing. Right. So right. Do that. But but back to kind of the, the practical, if you start out, you know, in an entry level, then very likely if you do a great job, you'll work your way up to maybe like a team, like a team leader position, you know, or okay. maybe like some sort of manager, you know, hey, you're going to manage this whole team, whatever. Um, you know, maybe you'll work your way into like a director level or, you know, whatever. I'm not trying to go through every single organization, but, oh, sure. but there's also like. Um, you, you could start to get larger, uh, you know, jobs like uh, like maybe an architect or mm. a, uh, you know, those kinds of things. The architect, not necessarily like, hey, now I'm an architect designing buildings, but I'm a, right. I'm a you know, cybersecurity. Designing architect. the system of security, I'm, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm designing the infrastructure. Hey, this is right. going to be a cloud-based application, you know, mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, remote users everywhere. And we got to figure out our access control problems and we got to figure out our, you know, um, whatever kind of cryptography issues we have or, you know, availability and, yep. and you know, efficiency and blah, blah, blah. So how do you put all those pieces together? There's a thousand pieces you have to put in place. Yeah. Um, and so someone has to take a step back and like build that picture, like build that whole, that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And so that would be a, re- that's a really cool place to kind of end up. But in order to end up at a place like that, you need to have done like some access control. You need to be that access control person you talk yes. about, yes. you know, do the access control, do the, you know, do the, some of the cryptography stuff if you can, or do the, you mm-hmm. know, uh, learn a little bit about, uh, about the cloud, you know, uh, environments and, you know, how those things work and just that kind of thing. And then, it, and then after a while, you'll start, you'll kind of look back one day and you'll be like, Hey man, I've actually learned quite a, quite a few different things. You <laughs> I know, know a lot then, of things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then the boss is going to be tapping on your shoulder saying, Hey, guess what? You're like our best person to architect out this whole mm-hmm. new thing. And you're going to be like, mm-hmm. what? And I would say just from a personal uh, perspective, this is just been true in my life mm-hmm. is if you have an opportunity to like kind of step into a new role, even if you're a little bit nervous about it and you're like, man, I don't know the first thing about that. Mm-hmm. I would say, I would encourage you just do it anyway mm-hmm. and do a great job and learn. And you will find that, uh, you know, that you, that you learn a ton of new stuff. And, and after a while you are going to look back and you're going to say, okay, I actually know a few things about all this stuff. So, <laughs> so be, be willing to be willing to take the risk, you know, yeah. take the leap. Right. So that's a, it's a good thing to do. 
I love it. Uh, as we wrap up today, John, uh, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Uh, yeah, yeah. So as we wrap up today, uh, please tell us more about uh, you have other classes that you teach through InfoSec Skills or your work with uh, Fortinet or anything else you'd like to promote. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. It's mm-hmm. self-promotion time. This is my Absolutely. favorite thing. Absolutely. Well, time for the plugs. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, so actually, so I've done, I've done a couple of the, of the different skills learning paths um, with InfoSec. Uh, and they're both they're both the Awash top ten. It was the 2017 list, ah, and now yeah. the 2021 list. So okay. those are the two that I've done. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't quote me on this. It depends on yeah who is watching and when and all that stuff. The okay. 2017 list. I think InfoSec may say, hey, at some point we need to just kind of archive that away because it's mm-hmm. getting older. And let's just like highlight the 2021. So I can't guarantee that they're both out there at any right. point in time. Um, but anyway, but but the, one of them will be out there. You know whatever. Okay. So. So Great. get out there and check that out. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun. And then, uh, and then, yeah, just the work I've done, like I said, I mean, I've done a lot of stuff through the air force and, you know, some different consulting with, with mm-hmm. the department of defense and, um, and right, right now I work for uh, Fortinet, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a security company. They do awesome work. I worked at F5 networks prior to that. Um, and I, again, I can, I can say with both of those uh, companies, I got into that. I'll, I'll just tell my quick F5 story for a Please. quick second. Absolutely. I got into F5. A buddy of mine was like, hey, John, we got this thing. Um, and I did not know the first thing about F5, you know? And so mm-hmm. I was, so there was definitely a lot of like, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. What's going on? But I said, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. And so I jumped into it and I just, you know, kind of nose to the grindstone and I, I studied a lot. I learned a lot. I asked a ton of questions. And then, you know, as I look back on my F5 time, it was awesome. F5 was awesome. Um, then I'm like, man, I actually learned a lot of stuff there at F5, you know. And then now I'm with Fortinet. Fortinet's also awesome. Just amazing people. They're super smart. Um, then you know, it's a similar kind of thing. It's like, hey, I don't really know a lot about this stuff. I, I have now learned about the, you know, the overarching, you know, how, hey, how does the internet kind of work? Like, what is a computer and just that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But to learn the specifics of that job, yeah. It's going to take a lot of work, you know, it's going to take a right. lot of studying and all that stuff, but that's okay. Cause I'm learning now I'm learning even more stuff, you know? And so I look at it as a good, you know, just a good personal building experience. Yeah. You know? So I would, again, that's why I encourage people just go ahead and take the leap and, and right. do it, you know? So, um, so yeah, so that's, um, that's, but, it, but in terms of promotion and all that, I would just encourage people to take the, take the top 10 skills learning right. crap here at, at InfoSec and hopefully you'll enjoy it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, you think about the times when you were like most exhausted when you were trying something new and you just push through and push through and then you're like, I can't do it anymore. And then you get done and you're like, wow, I suddenly am a different person almost at the end of it. I know. I did mm-hmm. that. I know. Mm-hmm. That's cool. But you got to do it. You got to start in order to do yeah. it. Yeah. Try. Uh, yeah. So uh, one last question, $10,000 question here. If our listeners want to learn more about John Wagnon and your OWASP courses, where should they go online? Well, like we said, go to the go to InfoSec and yep. sign up for the uh, the OWASP Top Ten Skills Learning Path, and you'll yep. uh, you'll see it there. Hopefully, you'll have a great time, and you'll be mm-hmm. like, "Hey, you know what? I want to watch that all over again, like ten more times." <laughs> just um, leave it running in the background. Yeah. Just keep it run just on an infinite yeah. loop, you know, yeah, yeah, no yeah, problem. Yeah. No problem. Um, Dulcet yeah, Jones so, of John Wagner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just go to bed and wake up. Yeah, you know, yeah. with my voice. That's right. Um, and then, and, and then it's in, in terms of connecting, man, I'd love to connect with whoever wants to. Uh, probably the best is LinkedIn. Sure. Um, so I'm out there on LinkedIn. Um, cool. I, I'm trying to remember the the little URL. I think it's just slash John Wagnon, if I remember right. But anyway, okay. you'll if you're if you're if you're watching this video, you kind of see what you I you know want. how to do that. Yeah, and you'll see on LinkedIn, <laughs> right? If you know that, right. if if you need help on that, you know whatever. But uh, yeah. but yeah, so that's so LinkedIn is probably the best place to to connect. Although I, I would say I'm on Twitter. Although I don't really do a lot on Twitter. Yeah. I'm just kind of more than I'm, I'm one of the lurkers. Like, hey, let me just kind sure. of watch. So I don't really post a lot on Twitter, but, uh, but I am on there. Someone wanted to, you know, connect okay. or whatever. So great yeah, good stuff, man. Appreciate it. All right. Well, John, thanks for your time and insights today. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely, man. It's been a pleasure. It's been awesome, Chris. Great. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone at home who is listening and supporting the show. Uh, new episodes of the Cyborg podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page and on audio, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, And I wanted to make sure you all know that we have a lot more than weekly interviews and cybersecurity careers to offer you. And in fact, uh, for those of you who are interested in InfoSec skills, you can actually learn a little bit of cybersecurity for free on our InfoSec skills platform and our uh, trial program here. If you go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and create an account, you'll start learning right now with a uh, cross-section of some of our 
hundreds and hundreds of InfoSec skills courses. You get 10 free cybersecurity foundation courses, six cybersecurity leadership courses, 11 courses on digital forensics, 11 on incident response, seven on security architecture, DevSecOps, Python, JavaScript, ICS, SCADA, security fundamentals, and more. So just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and get started today. Unfortunately, John Wagnon, uh, you got you got to go in and, and, and get the, uh, the premium tier there. So you're going to, you're going to, but you're going to want to after you see that. So that's worth every penny, right? Chris? Worth every penny. Absolutely. So <laughs> thanks once again to John Wagnon and thank you all for watching and listening today. We will talk to you next week. Thank mm-hmm. you.